tales of ghosts are as old as the hills, and even if you don't believe, they always make for good storytelling on dark, stormy nights. <laughs> but if the tale is told right, not only does it send shivers up your spine, but it makes you start to question, could it be real? So if you believe that cemeteries, civil wars, and jealousy murders make for good ghost stories, be prepared to be scared. You're about to witness a recipe for the dead rising. Our tour of America's haunted hotels kicks off with one of the most famous and beautiful hotels on the West Coast. And because this hotel's first class, people are dying to get in. When the Hotel Del Coronado was built in the 1880s, crowds of people used to picnic at the site just to watch this masterpiece of Victorian architecture go up. More than a century later, crowds still come to enjoy this elegant destination hotel, and with good reason, it's conveniently located on the small island of Coronado, just off the California coast, a short drive from the great restaurants of San Diego. There's something about the Dell that is so unique. I think its history is certainly a significant magnet. And the architecture, uh, as you know, you've seen it yourself, is absolutely spectacular. And uh, the location, being on uh, 26 beachfront acres, uh, is truly almost impossible to replicate anywhere else. And for the last hundred years, the Coronado has attracted big names from all over the world, including world leaders, crowned heads of Europe, as well as American royalty. The Hotel Del Coronado has even doubled as a movie set, like in the Hollywood classic, Some Like It Hot, starring Marilyn Monroe. But this hotel's most famous guest might be a permanent resident. She's a Victorian beauty named Kate Morgan. I definitely believe that Kate haunts a hotel. But will you believe it too? The eerie tale begins as mysteriously as it ends. Kate Morgan checked into the Hotel Del Coronado on November 24th, 1892. Suspiciously, she signed in under what would prove to be a false name, Lottie Bernard. She was alone, had no luggage, and appeared to be ill. One point she asked some for a glass of whiskey to be sent to her room. She was very ill. Every, everyone at the hotel recognized that, and she was in a lot of pain. Kate Morgan spent five days at the Hotel Del Coronado. On the sixth day, she was found dead. Kate's body was actually found here the morning after she killed herself by a hotel employee. After discovering her body, he alerted to everyone at the hotel. Then they began the painstaking process of trying to figure out who she was and where she came from. When they could not really determine her exact identity, they did a sketch of her face and they sent that sketch to newspapers and police agencies throughout the country. The newspapers around the country began calling her the beautiful stranger because of the mystery surrounding her identity. Finally, the police received an anonymous letter identifying her as Kate Morgan from Iowa. The news shocked the country. Suddenly, Americans became entranced by this mysterious woman who traveled alone without luggage and with an alias. You can imagine what a um, traumatic and kind of scandalous event this was back in 1892. Gradually, they pieced together the background of this tragic beauty. She and her husband used to ride the trains around the country and gamble. And she supposedly posed as her husband's sister so she could distract the gamblers, and then he would make money off of his uh, competitors. But on the train to San Diego, Kate and her husband had a fight, and he left her. At the Hotel Del Coronado, she waited, hoping he would join her. Finally, 
alone and desperate, she gave up. Though Kate Morgan has been dead more than a century, she apparently has never left the Hotel Del Coronado. She was young, she was broken hearted, she was on her own, and she killed herself. And I like to say, you know, even a Hollywood screenwriter couldn't come up with a be better potential ghost than that. Over the years, countless visitors to the Coronado have reported seeing, hearing, or feeling Kate's presence. Karen Lakis is one of them. As I'm putting the key in the door, I'm glancing over my right shoulder, and I glance over and see this beautiful, beautiful, stunning woman um, who's also putting the key in her door. And we nod as if to say goodnight. We don't speak. And I take one step into my room and realize that this is not a woman of our era. She was a woman dressed in a beautiful Victorian gown. Her hair was done up. She was absolutely magnificent. And I realized that I had seen a ghost. And many other hotel guests have made the same claim. Kate seems to appear most often in the room where she stayed during her last days. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the Dell. The Coronado's doorman, Wayne Wright, was showing curious tourists through the room when he noticed something very unusual. I'm standing about probably four feet from the actual bed, and I looked down and I noticed that there was an imprint of a person actually lying, like someone was lying in the bed. There was the shape of the body and then in the pillow there was an indent. I just reached down and grabbed it and just tried to pull and it wouldn't straighten out at all. At that point I was like, okay. <laughs> Obviously not the professional to deal with this. Later that evening, a couple staying in the room said they had their blankets jerked away from them in the middle of the night. The wife remembers having the covers taken away from her, but she thought her husband was hogging them. And only the next morning did he say to her, did you see what happened? And what he saw was the outline of a woman ripping the, the, the sheets and blankets and bedspread off the bed. You might think all this activity would make the room unpopular, but think again. People are attracted to this. It, there's, there's a curiosity. Uh, about the unknown. If you say, gee, I, I really like to know more about that. And so there are people who really get excited about this kind of stuff and they'll call here and specifically, specifically, emphatically ask for this room. They want to stay in this room. Just forget staying in room 3327 on Halloween. That's Kate Morgan's room and it's usually booked. But don't worry, you're just as likely to see Kate any other night of the year. Of course, there are no guarantees, but if you keep your eyes open and your nerves steady, who knows? You just might meet the beautiful ghost of the Hotel Del Coronado. Coming up. More than half the U.S. population believes in unexplained phenomena. And one-fourth of all Americans claim to have seen or felt the presence of a ghost. But whether you believe or not, everyone seems to love the thrill of being scared. The next stop on our tour of America's haunted hotels takes us to Long Beach, California, where the renowned ocean liner, the Queen Mary, dropped anchor more than 30 years ago. One of the top hotels and tourist attractions in the state, more than a million and a half visitors come here every year, and not just for the food. Guests tour the ship, dine in her restaurants, or spend the night in one of her many historical staterooms. So what draws all these people to a big boat that never leaves the dock? First of all, uh, she was the third largest of the ocean liners built during the uh, era of the great passenger liners um, at over 81,000 gross tons. She's over 1,019 feet long, 118 feet wide, and has 12 decks. Uh, she's in fact much bigger than the Titanic, uh, which for many people, uh, they believe that was the largest ship ever built. Uh, but you would have actually been able to have nested the Titanic within the Queen Mary's hull. 
The impressive details of her specs aren't all that appeal to visitors. Rumor has it, there are also other worldly lures. The first is the incredible uh, stories that people have to tell the memories that incorporate the essence of this ship. Uh, the second is the physical beauty of the ship. Uh, this is one of the few true Art Deco treasures that still exists anywhere in the world. And third, I suppose, would be the ghosts of the ship. That's right, she said ghosts. It's been said that life aboard the most luxurious ocean liner ever to sail the Atlantic wasn't all tea and crumpets. It was frequently filled with drama and death. It began not long after she was launched in England in 1936. It was then that she was pressed into military service as a troop carrier during World War II. Queen Mary is credited along with the Queen Elizabeth of shortening World War II by a full year because she could carry so many troops at one time. She still holds the record for the most persons ever aboard a ship, 16,000 passengers and crew during one crossing. Uh, they were packed on like herring. You could hardly walk across the deck. There were so many people. When World War II ended, the Queen Mary carried war brides and their children away from their homes in Europe to a new life in America. Even when her war service was over, the Queen Mary's clientele was anything but ordinary. Film stars uh, such as Bob Hope, Elizabeth Taylor, uh, Fred Astaire, uh, probably the world's most famous romantic couple, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, traveled frequently on the Queen Mary. In addition to the legendary names, there have also been some legendary tales. Records show that in the more than six decades since the Queen Mary made her first transatlantic crossing, there have been a large number of deaths on board the ship. And it's said that the spirits of many of those people are still here and make themselves known frequently. They're sort of minding their own business, doing what they would do during a passage on the ship. Uh, and they don't seem to realize that they're spirits. They seem to think they're, they're part of the crew or part of the company of the uh, passengers on the ship. In fact, ghost sightings are reported so frequently that the ship recently opened a new tour. Ghosts and Legends of the Queen Mary. We're now entering the officers' accommodations. This is an area of the ship where the senior officers had their cabins. And every part of the ship is said to have its own dark story to tell. 1947, a senior second officer accidentally drank some tetrachloric acid, thinking it was gin, and actually poisoned himself to death. Uh, since that time, there have been reports of ghostly sightings in the officers' quarters and also in the bridge and wheelhouse directly above us. And that's just the beginning. One of the bigger parts of uh, Ghosts and Legends is this, that it's in the lower forward areas of the ship, which have not been open to the public since the ship arrived here in 67, and before that, only available to the crew members. So the public has never been in these areas. boiler rooms and storage areas way below the waterline. This dark and creepy underbelly of the ship is the last place you'd want to be trapped. A perfect place to tell a ghost story, I should add. We're now entering a part of the ship known as the isolation wards. These were hospital facilities that were designed to take care of passengers who were discovered to be traveling with communicable diseases. It's also been documented that the isolation wards were used as a holding area for stowaways that were arrested traveling illegally on board the ship. But rather than being jailed here to face the consequences, some of them committed suicide. And one of the most famous ghost stories is reported to have happened right here. In the depths of the Queen Mary shaft tunnels is watertight door number 13. And in July of 1966, a very tragic accident occurred here involving a young fireman's apprentice. The young man opened the door to get through but got caught by it. And you can see by this, the size of the door and also these massive gears, it would be very painful. The door came back on him and trapped him in here. He was crushed to death. And ever since then, strange supernatural occurrences have been reported at this very spot.
not only sightings of ghosts, but also of sounds and experiences. And we don't know for sure, but it's possible that the tragic accident that occurred here at Watertight Door Number 13 may have something to do with the supernatural phenomena that occur in this area of the ship. But this isn't the only place they say spirits tend to gather. Many believe the swimming pool is the most haunted part of the ship. People claim to hear laughter, splashing water, and wet footprints, even though there is no water in the pool. There are some psychics that believe that there are over several hundred ghosts that occupy this area of the ship. And they believe that there's a vortex into another dimension by which these ghosts come and go. And it's this poltergeist epicenter that people from miles around hope to catch a glimpse of. Well, some of the oldest stories that I've ever heard of reports of ghostly activity in this area involve a woman in a swimming suit. Sometimes she's seen around the swimming pool ready to dive in. Sometimes she's seen up on the balcony. But in any event, she always disappears. It's believed that one staple spirit of the Queen Mary is a little girl who appears all over the ship. Yet the story behind this little girl ghost will forever remain a mystery. She um, is a trickster and a prankster. She slams doors and appears to want to play. Uh, people will look, look up and see this little girl in a bonnet uh, with a period dress. They'll realize she's sort of floating and look down and see she has no legs and disappears. But she's, she's pretty spectacular. <laughs> The staff says that ghost sightings are so common among the crew members that you're not really considered official until you've had one. It's sort of, a, sort of like a tradition, a, you know, a rite of passage. We, call the, we like to call the people who haven't had an experience here paranormally challenged. Some people have suggested that the owners of the Queen Mary take steps to get rid of their ghosts. Maybe a giant shipboard exorcism. But the staff adamantly disagrees. No. Uh, we figure they are having a good time. They might as well stay and enjoy themselves. I have never really spoken to anyone who have felt threatened or endangered uh, by any of the experiences that they had. So I think for the most part, the, the, uh, the hauntings of the ship only help to enhance the, the romance and the nostalgia of the Queen Mary. So don't be fooled. One trip aboard the Queen Mary, and you might be convinced that it could be one of America's most haunted hotels. Still to come, hundreds of hauntings reported at the same blood-strewn site. Find out why spirits might linger on this hollow ground. And which haunted hotel was made famous by the king of horror novels? Here's a hint. Here's Johnny. People love to be scared, which is why the American curiosity with the undead has long been a staple of the entertainment industry. I'm Vincent Price. You're invited to my party in the house on Haunted Hill. They're called horror flicks and they leave audiences screaming for more. There are some who would argue that you don't need a million dollar movie to see ghosts. That is, if you know where to look. Our tour of America's haunted hotels stops off in the Rocky Mountains, just above the small town of Estes Park, Colorado. It's famous for its magnificent views, its incredible turn-of-the-century architecture, and maybe even its ghosts. You can expect to see ghosts almost every day, if you're lucky. Welcome to the Stanley Hotel, where horror meister Stephen King wrote portions of his best-selling novel, The Shining. In the summer of 1973, Stephen King camped out in room 217 and let the Stanley supposed apparition population inspire him. And although the Stanley's real ghost stories are not quite as gruesome as those in The Shining, they're still said to spook the masses. They're not going to throw you into the wall or steal your jewelry or, or things that some other ghosts might do. The staff claims that these ghosts will not hesitate to play tricks on you to get your attention. They just want to say, hey, I'm here too. 
The man who built the hotel was F.O. Stanley, a wealthy Boston businessman and inventor of the Stanley Steamer, an early horseless carriage powered by steam. Unfortunately, rich as F.O. Stanley was, he was also very ill with tuberculosis. In the early part of 1903, he went to his doctor, he was weighing about uh, 118 pounds. His doctor told him, and he put it just as bluntly, don't make any plans for the fall because you probably won't live that long. Stanley's doctor prescribed the clean mountain air of Colorado. So he and his wife, Flora, decided to build a luxury resort that would not only improve his health, but might also increase his wealth. And so if he can't be where the action's going on, you know, back where all of his businesses are, maybe in a sense you can imagine he would be motivated to build this grand resort hotel to invite other successful industrialists out here. Basically, he brought the action back to him. A few years and half a million dollars later, the Stanley Hotel opened its doors. This heart of the Rockies retreat was immediately popular and remains so to this day. The Rocky Mountain National Park is about four miles from here, so you can come check in, spend the day in the park, driving around, there's beautiful hikes. In summer, we have an outdoor heated swimming pool. Hopefully, we'll keep you really busy. But they say no one is too busy to notice the ghosts. It's believed that Mr. and Mrs. Stanley are still there and are always ready to greet their guests. It's reported that Flora's favorite haunt is her old music room and that she still loves to play the grand piano her husband gave her almost a century ago. The night manager was doing his paperwork at the front desk and he heard what he thought was a radio. And so he went out into the lobby and was going to say to whoever might have a radio on, please turn it off because it was late. And there was no one out in the lobby and, and he walked toward the music room where the music seemed to be coming from. And when he got to the door, he could see that the piano keys were moving. When he crossed the threshold to the door, they stopped, and the music stopped. One family staying at the hotel even reported hearing Flora playing the piano in broad daylight. It was 11 o'clock on a Friday morning. The hotel was full of guests. It was the middle of the summer. They were walking by, heard music, followed the sound of the music, came to the music room, looked inside. No one was there. The music was still playing. They stepped inside, and the music stopped. It seems Flora has no interest in playing for a captive audience. It's also been reported that Mr. Stanley's favorite room, after all these years, is still the billiard room. It was during one of our tours, and the ghost of F.O. Stanley started to materialize behind one of the people on the tour. And then before he fully came into um, total detail, faded away again. And that's his room. The pinion billiard room was his room where he liked to more or less hang out and uh, play billiards and talk with his guests. But the staff also insists that the Stanleys like to keep a close eye on their employees. As a matter of fact, our front office manager was just saying that she was standing at the front desk, nobody was in the lobby, and she looked up and F.O. was standing in front of her with a long black jacket down to his knees, and she knew it was F.O. The most amazing story that I've heard uh, involves um, F.O.'s picture being thrown across the room to land in a soiled spot on the carpet. And so we all assumed that perhaps Flora was upset with the spot on the floor and wanted that cleaned up. For most guests, the most interesting part of the ghost tour is the fourth floor. In the old days, servants of the hotel guests stayed up there. The corridors are narrower, the rooms smaller, and the ghost stories even more eerie. Paranormal research suggests that at least 12 different entities reside at the Stanley, and stories conclude that occasionally they show themselves all at once. On another occasion, a bellman came around the corner onto this wing, and as he did, every single door flew open simultaneously. Much of the 
action is claimed to center around room 418. This is where the cleaning crew routinely hears strange noises and finds imprints on the bed, even when no one has been registered for the room. And sometimes, guests report hearing children playing in the hallways. On one occasion, two separate couples checked out before they were due to check out uh, because they said that they couldn't sleep all night because of the children playing in the corridor and making noise. Well, there were absolutely no children registered at the hotel that night on any floor. Years ago, word of ghosts at the Stanley Hotel might have ruined business. Today, it's a major attraction. I'd like to see something. I'd like to have some fun, but you know, I don't want to you know, freak out and go through years of uh, therapy. You know, so I'd, I'd like to see something and have fun, but nothing too traumatic. So if your idea of fun is seeing unexplained ghostly phenomena, you might want to get up your nerve and check into this scare palace. And while you're there, pay your respects to Mr. and Mrs. Stanley. They're always ready to entertain. Coming up, murder at a Louisiana plantation home results in an eerie ghostly legend when Haunted Hotels returns. At least once a year, Americans love to be scared. It's the celebration of All Hallows' Eve, October 31st, better known as Halloween. But there could be some haunted houses to visit all year round. Our next ghostly destination is the famous Myrtle's Plantation, one of the last remnants of the Old South. The Myrtle's is located in St. Francisville, Louisiana, deep in the heart of the mysterious Bayou Country. The Myrtle's is known for its ornamental ironwork on the veranda hand-painted stained glass, and even its ghosts. Hotel guests Holly and Mark Peretti had heard rumors about the place, but wanted to see it for themselves. When we got here today, uh, we were walking around the grounds, and it's kind of, it's kind of creepy out there. The house has a very distinct um, personality. It's very unique um, and elegant, but very creepy, which I would expect it to. Maybe it's the long, dark shadows cast by the centuries-old cypress trees. Maybe it's the misty gray Spanish moss clinging to their branches. But most likely, it's the endless rumors of ghost sightings. In fact, in a Smithsonian Institute study in 1980, the Myrtles was labeled as America's most haunted house. Today, this place is ranked among 13 of the spookiest places in the country. Of course, with every spooky hotel, there's a chilling tale to tell. The Myrtles house is known for its curse. And the story is, General David Bradford built the plantation in the late 1700s on the site of a Tunica Indian burial ground. They were not burying their dead. They would hang the remains, thinking they were close to the sun gods and letting them decay. So the house and the parking lot is on top of what was burial ground at one time. And a lot of people feel the plantation can't help but be cursed because the burial ground was destroyed. And here's how the curse unfolds. The general's daughter married Judge Clark Woodruff. The judge had a slave mistress named Chloe, who had a bad habit of eavesdropping on the family. The judge repeatedly warned Chloe not to do it, but when he caught her at it again, he cut off her ear. A few days later, Chloe took her revenge on the judge. 
Instead of the usual recipe for the oldest daughter's birthday cake, Chloe threw in oleander leaves, which have the same effect on the body as arsenic. His wife and two children died from the poisoning. This is one birthday party the judge would never forget. But some say just because they died doesn't mean they left the scene of the crime. There are three of the ghosts, along with Chloe, who was the slave, who still live here. And it's these unseen inhabitants that people come from all over to try and catch a glimpse of. Some people even say they can see Chloe in the mirror and the judge's children skipping through the Myrtle's courtyard. Tita Moss and her husband have owned the Myrtles for more than seven years. Before they bought it, they were told the Myrtles was haunted. They just didn't believe it. We thought that that was probably an advertising ploy. Having been a marketing major in college, you know, there's lots of hooks that you use. And we obviously were not afraid because we thought, gee, ghost, what a hook. That's great. Bet they get lots of tourists. Had absolutely no idea that it were actually a haunted home. But they figured it out for themselves. We had been here about three weeks when my two-year-old sat up in bed and asked me to please get the little girl off the chandelier. I immediately thought, hmm, this is going to be fun. Later, Tita took photographs of the plantation. When they were developed, she noticed something strange about the pictures. So here is a picture that was taken for insurance. A lady shows up who's transparent. She happens to have a turban on. And as you well remember from the tour, Chloe always wore a turban because the, her earlobe was severed for eavesdropping. The lady Chloe murdered Sarah Matilda and the two children. Can you see that you can just see the boards right through her body? Yeah. It's just, it's easily seen. As she looked closer, more strange figures seemed to be staring down from the plantation roof. Can you see the little boy and the little girl right here on the roof line? Right there. Yeah. Is that not remarkable? The other thing that makes this hotel different is that the Myrtles doesn't provide any television, telephones, or radios. So what you see, or rather what you don't see, is what you get. You want something to happen because you ex it's like everyone is expecting you to come home with the story. And so you want something to happen, so you don't want to be like a wasted trip. But then again, I don't, I'm not so you sure I want anything to happen at all. <laughs> But when morning came, they had a story to tell. Shortly after they went to bed, they supposedly were awakened by the sound of footsteps. She was talking when it happened, and I didn't know she knew that I heard it. I kept it to myself because I figured if I acknowledged that I heard it, it would freak him out even more, so I just kept my mouth shut. But after that, I laid awake, my eyes wide open, running on pure adrenaline. Later, Holly claimed to have another encounter. I went back over to get the shampoo out of our room, and um, I didn't want to tell him this, but I swear, when I was walking back, I heard little, like, footsteps following me. What? Like, light little footsteps following me, like a little kid or something. I'm serious. Though Holly and Mark were scheduled to stay another night, they decided one night was enough. They were convinced the Myrtles was haunted. I did it once. I don't need to do it again. It seems the Myrtles has enough hair-raising tales to last this lifetime, and maybe a few more. Coming up next, in the bloody summer of 1863, more than 50,000 men died at the Battle of Gettysburg. Today, their spirits still haunt this hollowed ground on America's haunted hotels. Ghosts, ghouls, goblins, are you a believer yet? On America's haunted hotels, you've heard amazing stories of ghostly apparitions. First, we checked into the Hotel Del Coronado outside San Diego, California, where a suicidal beauty has been haunting the halls for the past 100 years. 
Then, we hopped aboard the most legendary floating hotel in history, the Queen Mary, docked in Long Beach, California. The spine-tingling stories of accidental deaths occurring on this ship are not for the faint of heart. Next, we toured Stephen King's inspirational ghostly abode, the famous Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado. And we dared to venture into the Myrtles Plantation House, where the curse of the Tunica Indian burial ground took its toll on a southern general and his family. Our tour of America's haunted hotels continues with a place steeped in American history. The fields are green and peaceful, the town quaint and charming. But on three hot July days in 1863, Union and Confederate soldiers fought the bloodiest battle in the Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg. There were more than 50,000 casualties and 28,000 of them cut down in a single terrifying day. Many believe their spirits still linger here. It's an element called sudden death syndrome. We had 55,000 soldiers who were exposed to sudden death syndrome, uh, the traumatic death. Uh, they've been ripped from life at a young age, 15, 17, 19. They had unfinished tasks and I think that their spirits are sticking around until those tasks are accomplished. Gettysburg is said to be the most haunted place in America, and the most haunted place in Gettysburg may be this 200-year-old building, the Farnsworth House Bed and Breakfast. When the sign outside advertises spirits, remember, it doesn't mean liquor. The Farnsworth House was built in 1810, that means almost two centuries of human drama and the potential for hordes of ghosts. Not forward. In fact, Which is why the Farnsworth House staffers regularly try to contact their resident specters through routine seances. At this point, if you would be kind enough to please join hands, we will let the seance continue. Most times, all they get is goosebumps. Other times, much more. For a relatively small structure, it's said that the Farnsworth House has a pretty hefty ghost population. From cellar to garret, there may be as many as 14 different war-torn spirit entities. But surprisingly, not all of them appear to be soldiers. One of the spirits had given birth to a stillborn child. It was a traumatic experience for her. And she's still here as long as the, the spirit of the child remains in the house. In addition, another woman haunts the bedrooms, a midwife named Maria. Some guests who've stayed in this room say they woke up to see a woman standing beside the bed. There seems not to be a, a mean bone in her body. She just is somebody who is very, very caring and looks after people. But most of the ghosts are said to be connected to the Civil War. During the Battle of Gettysburg, Confederate sharpshooters holed up in the Farnsworth House garret, kept the Yankees pinned down with sniper fire. And the story is, after long nights of shooting, the soldiers would gather together to rest and sometimes play music. Guests have reported hearing what sounds like a mouth harp being played in the wee hours of the morning. About uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, sounds like uh, a gentleman setting up here playing this mouth harp. Well, who could be up there at 2 o'clock in the morning? The answer always is the same, there's, no, there's nobody. Nobody alive anyway. They say there are more ghosts here than just soldiers and midwives. It's been told that there are also children who haunt these historic halls. In the early 1900s, a five-year-old boy was brought into one of the bedrooms. He'd been run over by a horse and wagon right outside the Farnsworth house and was too badly injured to be moved further. Five days later, 
He died, and it's rumored that his mischievous spirit still haunts this house today. It took only one overnight stay to convince this couple the house was haunted. The longer the night went, the more weird things happened. I felt like someone like tickling my cheek, and then I felt like inside my ear, and like my face like started going numb on the side. I felt like chills up and down my body, didn't sleep a wink. And as the night stretched into daybreak, the panic began to escalate from these strange feelings. I was petrified. I, I was like, every, every little sound I heard, I was like looking around the room, you know, like, what was that? The feeling that I got was kind of like, like a mischievous child tickling your cheek and just messing with you. It was bone chilling. I was good until, until he couldn't take it anymore and woke me up. Once morning arrived, they thought the spooky ordeal was over. She left the room this morning, and I went to take a shower, and, you know, I, you close the door behind you. When you take a shower, you get to take your clothes off, you know, close the door. It's kind of common practice. And I'm in the shower, I look over, the freaking door's open. Needless to say, this couple left right after breakfast. They seem to be in something of a hurry. Are you brave enough to dare a night in the Farnsworth house? Reservations are available for this ghostly Gettysburg Inn. If you visit the Myrtles Hotel in Louisiana, the Stanley Hotel in Colorado, the Farnsworth house in Gettysburg, or the Hotel Del Coronado and the Queen Mary in California, there are no guarantees that you will see a ghost. But if it does happen, there will be no doubt in your mind. When people talk about that, how do you know when you're in love? Well, you'll just know. How do you know that you experience a ghost? You'll just know.